Good evening, and welcome to the first meeting of the Linnaean Society's new program year. We're glad you could join us tonight. I'm Debbie Mullins, the president, and I call the meeting to order. I'm, I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing Dr. Brooke Bateman's presentation. I certainly am. But before we start, I have just a few housekeeping items to mention. Our annual homecoming picnic is Sunday, September 22nd at 1230 at Summit Rock in Central Park. In case of bad weather, we'll try for September the 29th. If you haven't already signed up, please RSVP on the website so that we know how many people to prepare for. LinneaNewYork.org slash homecoming. This is always a fun event, so you won't want to miss out. And please bring guests who are interested in the society. Also, on the morning of the picnic, Linda LaBella will be leading a walk in the Northwoods for beginning birders. If you or someone you know is just getting started with bird watching, please register for this walk on our website, LinneaNewYork.org slash field trips. Last month, the board of next month rather, the board of directors will vote to eliminate the need for prospective members to have a sponsor when applying for membership in the Linnaean Society. We've come to see that the sponsorship requirement can be a barrier to people who want to join, and it may be giving the false impression that the society is not truly open having everyone join. We hope that dropping the sponsorship requirement will send a strong signal that everyone who's interested in birds and natural history is welcome to join. This change will take effect in October. Last week, you were asked to vote on two motions, one to approve the minutes of the May meeting and the second to approve the membership applications of 15 new members. The minutes were approved with 100 in favor none opposed, and five abstaining. The new member applications were approved unanimously with 105 in favor, none abstaining, and none opposed. Please join me in welcoming these new members. James Jackson, sponsored by Brian Whipple, Emily Tenenbaum, sponsored by Kristen Ellington, Andrea Treguero, sponsored by Junko Suzuki, Thierry Brayette, sponsored by Richard Davis, Judy Grewal, sponsored by David Spahn, Ann Wenzel, sponsored by Kristen Ellington, Kitty Stanton, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper, Stephen Ogan B. Yee, also sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper, Catherine Payson, sponsored by Amanda Bielskis, Christy Tastian, sponsored by Mary Normandia, Val Coleman, sponsored by Samari Weinberg. Xiao Li, sponsored by Bonnie Eisner. Emily Jones, sponsored by Amanda Bielskis. Catherine Cobb, sponsored by Suzanne Zawicki. And Ro Rubel, sponsored by Amanda Bielskis. Welcome everyone to the Linnaean Society. We're very happy to have you as new members, and I hope you'll join us for some field trips and programs and get involved in the work of the society. Please come to the homecoming picnic on September 22nd so we can greet you in person. And finally, don't forget to pay your dues. Instructions for paying online or by check were in the email you received from me last Friday, September the 6th. Now let's turn to our program. We've muted your microphone and disabled the chat function. So if you have questions for Dr. Bateman, please type them into the Q&A. Following the presentation, Rochelle Thomas, former president of the Linnaean Society and currently the center director of the Greenwich Audubon Center will lead a question and answer session. Brooke Bateman is the Senior Director of Climate and Community Science at the National Audubon Society, where she collaborates with scientists, volunteers, and Audubon's Climate Initiative team to develop research focused on climate and the conservation of birds in the places they need today and in the future. 
In this role, she led a team of scientists developing Audubon's 2019 Birds and Climate Change Report called Survival by Degrees, 389 Bird Species on the Brink. She also led a team of scientists in developing Audubon's Natural Climate Solutions Report, maintaining and restoring natural habitats to mitigate climate change. This report provides a scientific framework to address both the biodiversity and climate crises. As the director of Climate Watch, a community science program, she works with volunteers to understand how climate change is currently affecting birds in North America. Her research focus is on spatial ecology and conservation, emphasizing the effect, the effect that extreme weather and climate change have on biodiversity. Brooke works closely with on the ground practitioners to link climate research to conservation and management actions. And her favorite bird is the common loon, and I'm sure she's going to tell us why. Brooke, welcome to the Linnaean Society, and thank you for speaking to us tonight. I'll turn the program over to you now. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Is everybody, Debbie, can you see my screen? Okay. I just wanted to double check before I get started. Yeah, it's looking great. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me tonight and attending. Um, I'm really excited to speak to you about some of the, the work that I do at Audubon and how we connect our biodiversity and climate change science to on the ground conservation, public engagement and policy action. Um, I talk a little bit about the work I do around climate science as well as community science. Um, so I, I wanted to start just sort of highlighting that we're in the midst of a biodiversity crisis and, and birds are, are some of the, the biodiversity that are in trouble. Um, and I really think Rachel Carson is a, a wonderful sort of um, person to bring to mind, um, given that we've had uh, issues with birds in the past. Um, Rachel Carson's uh, book, Silent Spring, is really brought to attention that we were losing birds at unprecedented rates and that the, the early mornings were strangely silent where they were once filled with the beauty of uh, bird song. Um, and so we've been to the point before where we've noted that actions that we were taking as humans were having an impact on birds, uh, in particular here, some of the pesticides. Um, and, and some of the species that were most affected by this are, are, were uh, are raptor species such as bald eagles. Um, this is actually a drawing that I drew when I was younger. Um, for a report at school talking about how uh, it, bald eagles were endangered and that we needed to do whatever we could to protect them, given that they had suffered the consequences of these uh, pesticides in the silent spring that, um, that Rachel Carson had sort of brought to light in the way that she communicated around the science that she understood. Um, and so it, it really was sort of part of the, the spark of my career to understand that actions that we take as humans can have um, dramatic implications for our wildlife species, including birds. Um, and now I'm in, in, here in charge of climate science and community science at Audubon, um, making sure that we continue that effort to listen to the science and take action um, on birds. Um, again, so... So we are in the midst of this biodiversity crisis since 1500, at least 680 vertebrates are confirmed to have gone extinct. Um, and that the red list index that IUCN maintains shows that the, the surviving species are being driven towards extinction ever faster. Um, and this is sort of a current rate of extinction um, graph that you can see back from 1500 up to the 2018 time period. Um, and you can really see after 1900, the, the real sort of uptick in trajectory in the percentage of uh, extinctions. And they are now 100 to 1,000 times higher than they were historically. Um, you can see amphibians, mammals, and birds are sort of the top of the list in those extinction rates. Um, I really want to highlight this is a full don't blown crisis, particularly for birds. Uh, a report that came out in 2019, um, the 3 Billion Birds Report, um, did highlight that one in four birds are, are gone since 1970. Um, that's uh, three billion birds uh, less that fly through our airs, uh, through our air and on, in our waters um, today. 
given the the sort of trajectory, this is this is really alarming. Um, and I do want to highlight where some of the worst losses is, and particularly focusing in on uh, our neck of the woods here in New York. Uh, migratory birds, we've lost 2.5, which is almost a 30% population loss in our migratory bird species, including two and five Baltimore Orioles. Um, Eastern forests, that's 170 million birds lost, um, including six and 10 wood thrush. Um, and if anybody has heard the sound of a wood thrush, it's one of the most beautiful, melodious calls, kind of flute-like, um, and it's something that has become less and less common um, to hear in our forests in the East Coast. Um, so what are the reasons? The, the main reasons that we birds are in trouble is habitat loss and degradation. Um, we have seen a lot of land use change in the last several decades, um, and particularly loss of forests, loss of um, grasslands is the, the main, one of the major habitats that we've lost. Um, but there are other threats as well that we need to consider, including cats, um, outdoor cats, in particular window collisions and other collisions um, that are also contributing to the decline of birds. So here at Audubon, we say that bird, um, the, the, the 3 billion birds that we've lost in North America, um, as I said, have been driven by habitat loss and more recently to climate change. Um, we have this commitment at Audubon to sort of re reverse this trend. So we have this trend of birds um, declining. We, we call this the bird trend. Um, we have committed to a vision that a world where birds are thriving again, and we really want to um, work on our progress in, in terms of bending the bird curve. So stabilizing that loss and hopefully uh, reversing it so that we see an increase in, in species moving forward. Um, and so birds, of course, can't control their climate like we do. They are, they are the messengers of what is going on in our environment. Uh, because they're so intimately tied to the world around them, we can really look to them as messengers to see when things are changing in our world. And we are seeing that birds are arriving on their breeding grounds earlier. They're shifting or struggling in place in response to extreme weather events. Um, and they're even overwintering in places that they never did before. So uh, we like to think that birds are telling us how climate change is uh, affecting them as well as land use change. But more importantly, that climate change is, is affecting them and it's happening now. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a lot about climate science in this talk, but I also want to highlight the community science or citizen science work that we do at Audubon and, and how valuable community science data are for understanding these changes that we're seeing across um, the landscape. And so we wouldn't be able to understand how birds are responding to climate change without people like you going out and counting birds. And so i um, just going to highlight here the Audubon's Christmas Bird Count, which is the nation's longest running community science bird project. Um, this is one of the data sets, among others, including eBird and the Breeding Bird Survey, uh, among uh, many other surveys that have really let us understand over time how birds are responding to these global changes. In particular, the Christmas Bird Count is in, going to be celebrating its 125th year um, with the original survey in 1900, starting in New York City. Um, and it's really shown to be one of the most valuable data sets uh, of birds um, that we have. So a recent study that we put out at Audubon really highlights the dual crises of climate change and biodiversity loss and how they're really inter intertwined and how land use change and climate change can really impact populations. Um, we looked at nearly a century of Christmas bird count data to show that climate consistently limits the winter range edges of species where they can or cannot occur, um, whereas land use change really affects where birds lo occur lo locally through time. Um, and this figure is just highlighting different groups of bird species from raptors to songbirds to woodpeckers on the top um, through other groups of species. And this is the, the title of the paper. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, but essentially, we're seeing increases um, since the 1930s in areas that are blue on the maps um, and de decreases in areas um, in, in yellow. Um, and for some species, like I mentioned, climate change is a big driver and others is land use change and, and a combination as well. Um, but for some groups, particularly woodpeckers, um, you can see the strong trend of losses in the southern part of the country and gains in the north. Um, and so there's sort of this dual 
combination of the climate change and the land use change that is um, affecting where these birds occur through time. And what we're seeing is that even for widespread species, uh, as our winters become more mild um, and temperatures warm with climate change, uh, we are seeing these rain shifts, even for widespread and common species. So on the left, we have the hairy woodpecker, um, and on the right, we have white crowned sparrow. Um, this is how the abundance of these populations of these two species has changed um, from the 60s um, up through the, the 2017 time period from our Christmas bird count data. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of, of red in the south, which is where we're losing population, and a lot of blue in the north. And that's indicating that species are shifting into areas that are becoming warmer, that used to be too cold for them. Um, and this is sort of the common pattern that we see with climate change, where species shift towards the poles to sort of beat the heat um, as things get too, too warm. Uh, we're also seeing the same trends with ducks. Um, this is a, another study from the Christmas bird count of ducks in the eastern U.S. that have also shown changes in abundance in relation to the warming winter temperatures. Um, and so these are different species, and I apologize, you probably can't see each individual species, um, but the big map on the right is an average across all of our uh, waterfowl species and this, the same similar trend where we're seeing blue, where we have increases in abundance and red where we have decreases in abundance. Um, we're really seeing that shift in um, waterfowl and duck winter duck species uh, declining in the southern part of the US where it's getting hotter and moving into areas in the north. Um, and for some species, this means that they are overwintering in areas that they no longer did before meaning that they're just not migrating. They're deciding that the, the conditions are mild enough that they can persist in the northern part of their range, meaning that a lot of people that care about winter ducks in the southern US are not gonna be seeing them as often. And also there might be issues of resource um, capacity in the north where we're gonna be seeing large congregations of these winter ducks moving forward. Um, and then lastly, I also wanted to uh, um, highlight that there is kind of a new silent spring and soundscapes are changing. Uh, this is sort of the way that we um, hear the places that we live and we can really use um, sort of our community science bird monitoring data, also with bird recording data to um, really get the understanding of what that soundscape is of your local community and how that's changed over time. Um, and it's really suggesting that we are seeing um, a lot of changes and in particular nature sounds are growing quieter and less diverse over the last 25 years um, due to the changes in distribution of bird species as a, a result of these global changes. So it's really a change in our sense of place. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the wood thrush um, disappearing uh, here is a very a, a similar species. Um, so really tying, tying it back to that new silent spring and Rachel Carson and sort of highlighting that we can see that birds are already responding to climate change and global change um, with the historic amount of climate change that we've already seen. However, we also know that we are, are, are on a current path to have increased climate change um, into the future. And so what, what do we have in store with, under future climate change if we don't take enough action uh, on climate change? Um, and this is really what, where I want to kind of start talking about how we take the science and connect it to um, different ways to get people engaged around climate change and global change. Um, here, this is really linking our climate science um, around public engagement. And so I'm just going to talk us through some of the um, work that we've done around survival by degrees. We really are highlighting that climate change poses a threat to birds. Um, and that it, it's, a, it's a big issue, it's a five alarm fire, it's going on now and it's gonna get worse. Um, and that climate change kind of makes all of these issues of biodiversity loss, habitat loss, um, it, it makes it a threat multiplier. So all of that is going to kind of um, work together uh, against species if we don't take action. And so just to go through the science of what we did, we, we really wanted to understand how birds may respond to climate change. So we modeled the ranges of 604 species, um, uh, linking the bird occurrence data that we have from community science projects to environmental information to really estimate the current range of the species. Here's just an example of the wood thrush. Um, and then we project that information onto different climate change scenarios to see how um, that species range might change under different temperatures and precipitation conditions. 
um, what's in our models. We had, again, we have um, over 600 species, 140 million observations from well over 70 data sources. Uh, this is just a snapshot of um, 10,000 of those over 140 million records to sort of see where we're getting it across multiple data sources. Um, so really a lot of bird information, again, really highlighting the importance of uh, citizen and community science and, and how we would not be able to understand this without folks out there counting birds um, every day across the, across the hemisphere. Um, again, we sort of were linking it to conditions on the ground. So uh, we were linking it to climate conditions, both current and future climate conditions. Um, human land use, so where have things um, changed from like grasslands to croplands or or where do we have urbanization or where do we still have natural forest cover? Um, and so including that in the information as well as vegetation, habitat types and how those might change under climate change. Um, as, as well as for certain groups, like for example, here on the way right is uh, uh, surface water. So where is there water? Um, for various times of year, and that we link that to our species, like our waterfowl species. Um, we also look at a few different climate scenarios because we really want to be plugged into the policy and how we can take action around climate change in, in the po policy world. And so the three different temperature scenarios that we built into our models um, really plug into these call to action. So 1.5 degrees is the lowest and the sort of the best case scenario that we are including in our assessment. Um, and then we also assessed uh, the two degrees Celsius, which was the point that the IPCC suggests, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, what they suggest will um, start to see catastrophic changes in our environment after two degrees. And then finally, a three degree scenario, which is kind of where we're tracking um, and I'll sort of talk you through this figure, um, but that would sort of be kind of the worst case scenario based on the climate data that we use. Um, and so on the, the map on the right, I really wanna highlight that um, we're already at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming, probably a little bit more at this point above the pre-industrial average, which is very close to that 1.5 degree Paris Agreement goal. And again, these are global averages. So temperatures, a 1.5 degree Celsius temperature is nearly three degrees Fahrenheit. Globally, for the US, that actually tends to mean a lot higher temperatures, um, like up to five to nine degree um, change. So it, it, it can be a lot more locally. Um, and then so we're at that um, we're at that 1.2. Um, but currently, the sort of policies and actions um, and the, the targets, the, so these are like the pledges and the targets that countries say that they're going to commit to. Um, have us well above that. And so the current policies and actions that countries are actually doing um, have us closer to that three degree scenario. Um, and even the targets that countries say that they would love to be at um, have us only at that two and a half to two degree. And a really optimistic scenario, if, if everybody does everything, including getting all of their net zero targets, um, still has us a way above the 1.8 and close to that too. So just sort of putting the policy context on why we chose those scenarios. Um, and this is just one example, again, of the wood thrush of what those climate models look like. Again, on the left is the current range in yellow for wood thrush. Um, and then we have projections of a 1.5 and a three degree world um, for this species. And so I wanna highlight that blue indicates anywhere that is we consider range gain. So that means that area is not considered to be suitable currently, but um, could be in the future. Um, whereas red or any anywhere that is currently part of the species range that will become no longer suitable based on the factors of temperature and precipitation. And so here you can see the difference between a one and a half and a three degree scenario is pretty dramatic for the wood thrush. Um, at three degrees, this species is considered highly vulnerable to climate change. It loses a large amount of its range um, and really doesn't have a ton of places to consider um, suitable. A, a lot of them are actually worsening. Um, whereas at 1.5 degrees, there is still some range loss, but the species has a lot more opportunity um, across its range. So when we looked across all 605 species, we found that two thirds of North American bird species had this large amount of range loss, um, potential extinction from climate change. I'm just gonna cycle through a couple of species pretty quickly um, just to show you the, the dramatic nature of this. 
Um, so American goldfinch are pretty common and widespread species, um, up to 65% range loss in summer. Um, you can see a lot of the red particularly loss across large parts of New York, um, which is, is concerning given it's such a common um, favorite backyard bird species um, in, in New York. Scarlet tanager, a highly vulnerable species with nearly 70% range loss. Again, these are all at the, the high three degrees scenario warming. Um, Eastern towhee, one of uh, the favorite species that I have, particularly around the soundscape and, and hearing the species in the woods, um, up to 83% range loss. Um, and here, uh, the my um, as Debbie mentioned, my, my favorite species, the common loon, this is a map sort of cycling through the different scenarios and projecting into the future. Um, and for me, the, the common loon is my favorite species. I used to spend my summers in Wisconsin visiting my grandparents. Um, and this was the bird that got me really loving birds, the, the common loon and then the bald eagle story that I had mentioned earlier. These were places that I saw them in Wisconsin. I would visit and I would just be in, enthralled by the call of the loon across the lake. Um, and then looking at now in my career, looking at the climate projections showing that this species could no longer be occurring in Wisconsin with most of its range shifting out of the US, the, the lower 48 states at least, um, if we don't take action now is something that I take really personal. I think a lot of people have a favorite bird species. And if you if you see that that species is no longer going to be in that place that is so dear to you and you're not going to be able to see it, I think it really connects um, you to the, the reality of climate change, that it's not just polar bears in the Arctic, it's it's actually the birds we love and the places that we we love and, and connect with our families around them. So um, it's pretty dramatic. So one of the things though, like that we do want to make sure that we communicate, and this is really important for how we sort of engage with the public, is that we looked at those three different policy scenarios so that we can um, really get a sense of how much improvement we can do if we do take action on climate change. And so what we found is that if we take action and we stabilize climate change at 1.5 or at least below the two degrees, then 76% of those North American bird species are, are, are better off and have a lot less risk, meaning that they drop down a vulnerability category um, and they see a lot less loss in the future. Um, this is just showing that there's a lot less loss for the, the um, American goldfinch um, compared to the previous. We still see them across all of New York in the, the 1.5 degree scenario. Um, we also assess climate change related threats, and this is another way to connect people to the places that they live and show that climate change is something that's going to impact them as well. And it's not just, again, like this far off future problem. Um, so we looked at sea level rise, um, changes in land use, like urbanization and cropland are actually tied to climate change. We, we will see more people moving into cities as uh, actually, rural areas kind of collapse and, and crops become less um, sustainable. Uh, we see more extreme heat, droughts, uh, increased fire weather, heavy rainfall events, and fall springs. Um, and we just really wanted to show the difference between um, cli these climate change threats. So this is looking at all of those threats I just mentioned um, in individual locations. And what we're finding is we're actually seeing up to six of those threats at, at one place. And so particularly at that three degree scenario. So for example, in New York, we're seeing increased heavy precipitation rainfall events, we're seeing sea level rise, we're seeing urbanization, we're seeing heat waves and droughts, fire weather all combined into to, in one place. And so this is really kind of driving home um, how much more severe climate change it will be in the place that you live. Um, so affecting birds, but also people as well. Um, and we really also wanted to highlight that there are multiple species that might not be at risk to having to shift their ranges. They might not have a lot of range loss, but um, up to 57 of these species could face four or more of those threats, um, including these 14 species. Particularly our coastal species are facing a number of threats, particularly the impacts of sea level rise and urbanization sort of squeeze out the amount of coastal habitat that's available for them. Um, again, so we we really wanted to highlight the the sort of difference between the two scenarios and how many species are going to be facing lots of these extreme weather events in the future um, if we don't take action on climate change. 
Um, and then just, you can see here, this is sort of where we combined um, the number of birds, uh, how much climate change that they were seeing, um, and the number of vulnerable bird species. So uh, in the breeding and the non-breeding season, the darker the red means the more species are at risk. And you can see, depending on the time of year, pretty much everywhere across the U.S. is going to have some element of risk to our birds um, and to the people that live there. Um, but it really highlights that every bird species will experience some kind of impact from climate change. Um, and it's not all of our groups will be affected the same. Um, so our Arctic, boreal, western forest, and water birds are the most vulnerable when it, in, when it comes to this. But again, all of our species are going to be touched by climate change. Um, and this, this graph just shows everything on the right are considered the, the moderate and high and red and orange are our vulnerable species. So some of these groups are up to 100% of their species are um, at very, very high risk to climate change. Uh, including species that are already um, at risk. And so these species are already um, of conservation concern, indicating that their populations are declining currently, including piping plover, which is a, a species that really depends on habitats across New York. Um, they're also at risk from climate change. So again, it's bringing it back to that. We've already lost 3 billion birds. Climate change is going to be a threat multiplier and really trying to connect the dots as we communicate this out um, to, to folks um, and, and connect with it. So the first step was to, to sort of uh, develop the scientific publications. So we have several peer-reviewed publications out of this. And so that we want to start with the science first to make sure that um, we're communicating from science that is um, been, been vetted by other scientists. Um, we also work to really communicate this out to the public. And so birds can't fight climate change, but we can. This was the cover of our climate change magazine at Audubon. Um, really sort of starting to communicate the messages across to, to different volunteers. Um, we created a website you can go to. Um, you can look up Audubon Climate or Audubon Climate Survival by Degrees, where you can actually put in your zip code or your state um, and get a whole list of which species are vulnerable in your state under different scenarios and different seasons. So really trying to take this information from a broad scale national um, hem uh, whole North American picture to show you how your local area is going to be affected. And I think that, that the, the way that you are really going to communicate climate change is by bringing it to people's hearts and connecting with where they will see changes on the ground. In particular, for those that love birds, it really connects you to how the, your, um, the birds that you love are going to change in your particular zip code, again, or, or state. Um, with that, we've also summarized um, information on these like doc documents at a state level, showing which species we're going to change in that state, and particularly how much uh, some of those species that are going to be lost locally from that particular state. This is all available on the website. We also developed a study that showed how our national wildlife rescue system could, could change across um, the future climate change scenarios. So this is another way of localizing the information showing how particular refuges are at risk of um, not only losing species, but also gaining new species. And how are refuge managers going to have to manage those properties knowing that there's going to be a different species community and different interactions between those species. So really providing information for folks that are on the ground doing the work um, to better understand what those changes might be seeing um, at their locations. Um, we also took uh, the Survival by D Degrees report, um, communications frame, and an interactive tool directly to legislators and met with numerous federal and state policymakers to really convey the importance of taking immediate and aggressive action on climate change. Um, we also we met with leaders such as uh, Chuck Schumer from New York um, and used the visualizer to really look up their own zip code. Um, I know that Chuck Schumer was really, um, really wanted to see what was happening to Scarlet Tanagers, as I had showed earlier. Um, the picture is not great for them, but he was he, he really loves tanagers and it just really got his attention again, like taking a species of like a bird that people see every day and connecting it to climate change and showing them how it might change in their backyard as like a really powerful message for folks in, in bringing climate change into their reality. Um, we also created all of these um, sort of tools for folks to learn how to communicate themselves around climate change. Um, I'm not going to walk through this guide because I have um, 
some other stuff that I want to talk about, but um, we do have an award-winning climate action guide that tells you how to start the conversation and lead in your community um, and, and really sort of take action. Another way to talk to people about climate change is through art. Um, we have an Audubon mural project, which actually is all throughout New York City, where different artists have sort of adopted a um, species that is vulnerable to climate change and created these murals. Um, this is one that was a uh, trumpeter swans that is um, Carlos Pinto and John Sear had put together. Um, there's actually a wonderful documentary coming out about this. Um, but you can sort of go through New York and, and see these murals and connect through art, which is a way that um, a new sort of audience might um, get to understand the climate change and how it's affecting birds. So we actually did a study um, on, on all these different ways that we communicated to different audiences. Um, and we talked, uh, we went on CNN, we've had stories in the New York Times and USA Today. We were also on Fox News and Breitbart and regional outlets like the Chicago Tribune and Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, we got more than 2.5 billion media impressions um, in a more than 1,300 placements in just one month. Um, and so that 2.5, uh, billion media impressions. It's the visualizer has been used almost 50,000 times. Um, the book has been circulated 250,000 ho households, more than 33,000 people read the headlines. Um, and so sort of the what we found is that the people who were sort of reading this report were then taking actions online, um, completing at least one action online in support of our clean energy work. Um, and the message frame that really took that positive message of understanding how we could take action, it would improve um, for the conditions for birds under climate change. It really suggests that the messaging and the online visual tools that localize it and personalize it are more effective at motivating action. Um, and so it was really exciting to see um, that the sort of communication and localizing and storytelling can actually um, engage folks to take action. Um, so we really connected the dots between science and, and, and community engagement. Um, we also, I just want to highlight the linking the science to policy action. So we already know what we need to do. And so from a policy perspective, Audubon is really focused on protecting the places that birds need now and into the future, um, as well as taking actions. Personally, we also need to take actions at the state and federal level to address the root causes of climate change. Um, and I just want to bring it back to um, Rachel Carson again. This is like the message I want to kind of bring home here is that uh, with Silent Spring, Rachel Carson understood that DVT was concentrating in the, the food chain and really affecting our raptors, um, creating their, um, making their eggshells really thin so that they weren't having uh, reproductive success. Um, and so she, she sort of, her Silent Spring and this landmark um, understanding of the environmental movement that that science really sparked uh, what we could do for um, human safety. I just want to show that it actually translated um, in the work that she's done. We've gained over 15 million raptors since 1970, thanks to conservation efforts. And so but going back to that 3 billion birds report, the ra raptor species are one of the few groups that have actually done well. And that's because we knew what we needed to do and we took action. Um, and you can see that it paid off. And so policy wins are really, really important. Um, and so Audubon is really focused on leveraging our climate science um, to, so that people create a greater demand for climate solutions at the local, state, national, and hemispheric level. Um, and so we've really been focusing on engaging community advocates. Um, we have chapters across the US, um, over 400 chapters in multiple states. Um, as well as people that are really um, engaged and willing to take action. Um, on average, there are more, more than 1,800 active Audubon advocates per congressional district. And so you can see some, some places a little bit more active than others, but um, really trying to get people engaged um, from the policy perspective. So local, state, and national climate, activating folks at the grassroots level, looking for state policy wins, um, targeted action in swing congressional districts, national engagement with federal officials, and original contributions to science and storytelling. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of wins that we've had around the policy. Um, and so here is the first example in Washington State, where we, um, we took um, the sort of 
first steps for, by Audubon Washington to contribute to a historic clean energy policy and bill to help farmers and working lands capture carbon emissions. Um, and we passed a 100% clean electricity standard, uh, which requires that all electricity comes from carbon free sources by 2045. Um, and this was really done by targeting work with large, vibrant coalition of uh, and the governor's office, uh, focusing on smart focus and labor and business and collaborative recruitment efforts and community action meetings. And so it really took folks across the, the, the state to connect to get this, this policy win. And it started with our climate science and the understanding of how birds might be affected um, to sort of get folks across that state to, to come together. Um, in Arkansas, there was another win where we passed the Solar Access Act of 2019. This really tripled the size uh, limit of solar installations for commercial net metering customers, uh, permits for rooftop solar, and so that they could sell the power back to the grid and allowing leasing. Um, so this was really a, a, a coalition across corporations, including Mars, Target, Unilever, Walmart, local businesses, um, and it just was a tremendous bipartisan success um, that removed some pretty major regulatory barriers that have slowed the solar market in Arkansas for years. Um, so really exciting, especially in, in one of our um, uh, sort of southern states to be able to um, get that smart, clean energy capacity uh, improved for, for that state. Um, lastly, this was a pretty exciting grassroots support for renewable energy that benefits both birds and people. Um, thanks in part to Audubon members across the state, the South Carolina legislature um, unanimously passed the Energy Freedom Act, which helped ease restrictions on solar energy in the state. Um, and that they continue to sort of support this statewide um, uh, clean energy move. And it, it is really exciting because um, we as Audubon, uh, pe people like birds, um, no matter what your political affiliation is or your your beliefs, and people took action in, in areas that other nonprofits, environmental nonprofits weren't able to get into because uh, Audubon has members across the board in red areas and blue areas, and we were able to rally the constituents of, of some folks on the legislature that were kind of uh, resistant um, to get them to say, no, we need to take action on clean energy to, to take action on climate change. So it was really, really exciting to have uh, these wins, um, particularly this one in South Carolina. Um, and then building on this momentum, I do want to highlight that we continue to look for climate solutions that benefit birds. And we've, we have leaned in heavily to our clean energy work. Um, we did develop a birds and transmission report because we need to expand our transmission grid in order to support new clean energy projects. Um, and so we put out a report understanding where are the places that are gonna have the most risk for birds um, if we do expand our uh, transmission versus where are the places that we are already planning transmission so that we can understand these are the places that we need to show up and make sure that any project that's happening is done in a way that is going to be as bird friendly as possible. Um, in uh, one of the examples of this is working really closely with a, a program, sorry, a project called the Tunzia Transmission Project. Um, we were able to work um, with these folks closely to this project that will span 550 miles between central New Mexico and south central Arizona. It's, it's one of the largest clean energy infrastructure projects in American history. Um, but we worked directly engaging them to make sure that it was done in a, a way that was not going to be detrimental for birds and that we've actually taken um, practices, including routing, siting of towers, installation, tower de design, that so that it's as bird friendly as possible, including putting um, visual deterrents on the, the lines for bird species. So making sure we show up for these projects so that we can get the clean energy we need um, in a way that's not going to be harmful to birds. Um, and then lastly, um, just mindful of the time, it looks like I have about 10 minutes left, so I might breeze through this a little bit, um, linking science to conservation action. So again, I, I showed this slide already, but um, I talked a little bit about the climate mitigation that we call, which is sort of taking those climate change actions on the policy level, but I didn't talk a lot about the protecting the places birds need now and in the future, which um, from the climate change perspective, we talk about climate adaptation. 
Um, and so what, what are sort of the difference between the two? Why do we need both? Um, adaptation is the actions that we are, are, need to take to reduce um, or compensate for the adverse effects of climate change. No matter what we do, we are going to, we are already seeing and will continue to see impacts of climate change. And so we need to sort of build resilience into the system so that species and people alike can um, adapt to this, these changes that we are seeing. Uh, whereas mitigation takes actions or changes behavior to reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions um, so that climate change doesn't get worse. So we're, we're, we want to both adapt and deal with the climate change that we're going to see and then mitigate so that we can keep it as tamped down and as stabilized as, po as possible. Um, and that's why natural climate solutions um, are, are another important thing that Audubon is really invested in. Um, these this provides a path for both the adaptation and the mitigation, and it's it's a really important solution for tackling both biodiversity loss and climate change. Um, and that's because natural climate solutions um, is part of maintaining and restoring healthy native ecosystems that can permanently capture carbon dioxide from the environment through carbon uh, storage and sequestration. Um, and really the ideal solution because it's it's enabling healthy, natural um, ecosystems that um, can have wonderful places for, for birds and wildlife and, and nature to thrive, but also can store carbon through um, the ecosystem itself. And so together, we need both of them to really get to that balance between the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are removed from the atmosphere, produced with those that are removed from the atmosphere. So we want to lower the emissions by investing in clean energy. Um, and we also want to remove extra carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and this is sort of a path that's really highlighting um, the trajectory that we're on. So this is carbon dioxide. We have historic emissions and then sort of future emissions. Um, that top part, the, the most important part is the clean energy and the lowering our emissions. But we can't get to that less than two degree pathway without natural climate solutions removing carbon from the atmosphere. Um, so they're cost effectively provide roughly a third of the climate action we need by 2030, and they're available and proven now. So there's, like I said, there's a really, there's a growing understanding of the importance of natural climate solutions and harnessing nature um, to sort of uh, be in the fight for, for climate change stabilization. Natural climate solutions can look like a lot of different things. We kind of focus on the protect, manage, restore. Um, and so protecting forests, natural wetlands and grasslands, managing our forests and our farmlands and our grazing lands better, um, as well as restoring forests and, and wetlands, for example, that have been, been lost. These are really important um, actions. Um, just really briefly, uh, why carbon? Um, the plot on the left shows the, the global warming potential for all the different greenhouse gas um, generated in relation to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide has the lowest amount of um, heat trapping relative to the other. So methane is 25 times stronger, nitrous oxide is 300, and fluorinated gases can be hundreds to 10,000 times stronger. But the, the reason why carbon is such an important part of this is that it is up to 76% of the greenhouse gases that are existing in the atmosphere currently. Um, and they also stay in the atmosphere for a lot longer. Um, they can they can remain for tens of thousands of years, um, depending. And so the, the if we were to lose a forest, um, the amount of carbon loss, it would be on our time scale impossible to to re regain that um, in a meaningful time period. So we need to keep as much carbon stored as possible. Um, and carbon storage forests um, and natural systems are just fantastic at starving, storing carbon, um, both below ground in the soil, uh, as well as above ground in the trees, in their leaves and their, their growing material, um, and some even in that litter. So I just want to highlight that carbon storage is really important because we want to keep that carbon locked in our forests and not out in the atmosphere. Um, but we also need to pull more carbon out of the atmosphere, and, and this is really important for growing forests. And so um, forests can get to a point where they become saturated, um, but if they're um, 
cut down completely, that's when they release their carbon back into the atmosphere. And so we want to make sure that we're pulling more carbon in the atmosphere. So, so regrowth, restoring forests can be a really important action for that. Um, and at Audubon, we, we know that this is really important. I'm going to talk very quickly about a report that we put together where we identified areas that we want to maintain through protection and management um, and areas that we want to restore within various ecosystems that benefit both biodiversity and climate change. Um, and we know that this is sort of a path forward to help stabilize climate change and benefit birds and biodiversity. So in our report, which I can also share the link to, we identified priority areas to maintain. Um, these are what we call climate strongholds. So areas that are important for birds today and under future climate change based on those range shift models that I had shared earlier. We looked across many species to identify where are the most important places for birds that will continue to be important as they have to sort of shift through the environment to these changes. And then how does that align with areas that are already storing a lot of carbon and pulling a lot more carbon out of the atmosphere as they're actively sequestering carbon through, through their, their growth? Um, and these are areas that we identified as wanting to maintain, again, through protection um, and management. Um, but we also identified that there's areas that are vulnerable due to uh, disturbance um, where they are potentially not doing as well as it could for bird habitat. Um, or they are not storing as much carbon as they could because they need to be restored in order to be functioning properly. So we identified these areas um, as priority to restore. Um, and here, these are just the, a couple of the, the ecosystems that we looked at. I'm going to focus mostly on forests for the last five minutes or so of my talk. Um, but we identified areas to maintain and green across forests, grasslands, wetlands, and even in our urban ecosystems, there's opportunities for, for areas that are important for bird birds and biodiversity and also important for climate change stabilization. Um, and then areas to restore. These areas are going to be really important because that's where we're going to be pulling that additional carbon out of the atmosphere um, to really provide that critical habitat for birds, but also storing more carbon and stabilizing. Um, and combine these habitats store over 100 billion tons of carbon. Um, and if we can do uh, the restoration and the management actions we need, they have the potential to sequester up to twice as much carbon per year than they currently do. Um, and so forests, what do forest natural climate solutions look like? Uh, includes protecting large scale forests that are already um, happening, um, that already exist and addressing deforestation. Um, it's avoiding forest conversion. Um, it's improving the ex uh, existing agricultural lands to avoid that loss of forest. Um, natural forest management, there's a, a lot of wonderful organizations working on this, but end logging and old growth forests and extend harvest cycles, adopt reduced impact and logging practices. Reforestation, really actively planting native trees and managing these habitats, as well as working with wildfire management that is um, relevant for, for the particular place that you live. Uh, and then I do want to highlight, like, from a climate change perspective, here in the Northeast, we have up to a 55% increase in heavy precipitation events um, predicted for the future. Um, we've already seen some dramatic heavy rainfall events. I actually live in Stony Brook on Long Island, and just recently in the last couple of weeks, we had a severe um, one, over one in a thousand year storm of rainfall events where parts of my community were actually washed away. Um, and just really seeing how that is going to continue into the future, we need to sort of keep that in mind. But I do want to highlight that forests not only store carbon, but they also provide other natural um, uh, nature based solutions, um, including not just removing the carbon dioxide, but also helping with storm runoff and um, uh, air pollution. And so in particular, uh, oak trees, um, because of their large root systems and their broad canopy, um, the, the way that they spread, they can help manage uh, watersheds for uh, for better um, better than like root shallow root systems or, or turf grass. Um, they're really superior because they can they can that leaf litter can really soak up um, a lot more of the water um, and help with these heavy rainfall events. And they pull a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. So some of our native species are really kind of the answer to be looking to for these um, not only benefiting climate stabilization, but also helping with these heavy rainfall events that we're going to be participating in. New York has a lot of opportunity. We have 14 million acres that we can maintain um, and 7 million acres that are priority for restoration. 
already storing a ton of carbon and can sequester over 5 million tons of carbon per year. So a lot of opportunities for carbon. Um, but these forest birds are particularly at risk um, in our area. Again, 17% of them have declined since 1970. Um, but reforestation can provide successional forest birds like American woodcock and the wood thrush habitat while also pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and protecting mature forests will benefit species like the black-throated blue warbler. So it's got that dual benefit, again, of carbon and bird habitat. Um, it's really a win-win for, for what we need to do. Um, and then we can uh, lo localize and apply the climate science research. Um, and so something that I've been very actively working with state offices and government agencies on is to really leverage where are these important climate strongholds that provide carbon benefits? Um, in Suffolk County, New York, where I live, we I worked with the, the Suffolk County legislator to develop a pollinator pathway task force mapping tool. We also have a, a document that is in the works um, highlighting how you can sort of use native plants to provide um, opportunities for natural climate solutions. Um, but here we've mapped across the uh, Suffolk County, where are the most important places to put native uh, pollinator habitat that is also going to benefit birds and, and pollinators and climate change, to be strategically thinking about where can we focus our efforts uh, on these restoration opportunities, uh, where can we get communities that are already planting native plant gardens to, to focus to create sort of a pathway of habitats across, um, across the county. Um, just really highlighting the importance of native plants. Um, you can see here on the right, the, the root system of native plants are just much deeper than our non-natives. Um, and so that sort of benefits not only storing more carbon because there's more plant matter in those root systems, so they do store more carbon, but they're also more drought, drought tolerant and able to also with, withstand more of the, the sort of precipitation events because they're just more established in the system. So um, taking that sort of, again, national science and localizing it to how you can take action locally is, is something that we're really focused on um, at Audubon. Um, just another brief example, this is actually from Connecticut, but we have worked with um, Connecticut for uh, Connecticut Audubon. Um, their, their State of the Birds report in 2021 really committed to uh, uh, protecting 21% of the land and really focusing on the, these areas that we identified in this report as being the important places uh, to focus on because they do bring those benefits for birds and for biodiversity in general, but also for that climate change stabilization piece. So really important to connect the dots between the science that you do um, and the conservation actions that are taking the ground and providing that sort of roadmap for folks to say strategically, where do we need to focus our efforts? Um, and pretty exciting to see folks using the, the outputs. Um, and with that, I just wanna say, I, I hope I sort of shared a story about how you can take climate science and connect to different ways to take action, whether that's communicating to the public um, through events, um, showing up at like our Protect Our Nature days. I know we have um, Be A Good Egg days on, on Long Island. Um, showing up to do habitat restoration work or managing or, or working with local uh, landowners to have them understand that there are ways to do uh, grazing and farmland practices that will both benefit uh, climate change and birds, but also could bring revenue into that, their uh, sort of farming communities um, by doing things with a sustainable Audubon certified a conservation ranching certification for their, their beef or that you can show up um, for policy events or talk to your elected officials because really kind of showing them again, like the bird, like here, the New York state bird, Eastern bluebird, how is that species gonna be affected by climate change, bringing that to the elected officials, showing them how it's gonna happen in their backyard, um, really kind of showing that the storytelling is an important part and connecting to all these different aspects of actions that you can take. Um, including getting out there and counting more birds. So if, if your action is to go out and count more birds, that is really, like I said earlier, one of the most important things that we can do around our climate change science to understand how these uh, this wildlife will be affected moving forward. So we need folks out there counting birds so that we can understand how um, they're going to be affected into the future. Um, and with that, I'm going to end with um, Rachel Carson again. Uh, it's just, I think it's, she's just sort of speaks to what we need to do. Um, we really need to take action ourselves um, because we need to do it. We need to be the voice for nature. Um, birds are telling us it's time to take action, but we need to be the ones that step up um, and use the science to sort of 
have folks come along and, and understand that now is the time. Um, and with that, thank you. I'm happy to take questions um, and I appreciate your time. Yeah, um, Brooke, I just wanna say thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, I'm Rochelle Thomas, as Debbie mentioned, uh, a past Linnaean president and um, I'm reprising an old role here tonight. Um, I uh, There's already some great questions in the Q&A, but please, anyone who has a question, feel free to add it um, and I'll try to group them, but all of the ones that are in there right now are actually quite good. I, I wanna say I really appreciated that you mentioned Rachel Carson so many times because I just visited the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge three days ago. Um, so it's very timely and it's like, a, I recommend people go there. And I also want to say as someone who does manage a National Audubon Society um, center, and that is the closest one probably to the New York City area where many of you are located, we always, we have 700 acres in lots of ways for people to get involved directly with restoring habitat and planting natives and attending lectures and and doing things on a local level so see me if you if you want to do that um but there's also the great center at, at um, the tr center in oyster bay is also quite close to people in the city so there's ways to get involved there um i also last thing i want to say is i thought that personalizing it with the goldfinch and seeing the numbers change in the goldfinch something we consider as a bird that's in every backyard it's our potato chip song so i really i think that that's i'm going to probably steal that and oh, and show how much the goldfinch is declining because i don't think people would really believe it until they see that so yeah i thought that was really good thank okay, you okay i'm going to start off because really there's some good questions okay <laughs> um, <laughs> okay Ooh, first one is, um, the situation seems dire, but are there solutions? As urban birders, what actions can we take personally to either mitigate climate change or aid your science? And with NYC Climate Week coming up soon, are there sessions or programs you'd recommend people attending? Yes, great question. And I hope that the, as I sort of told the arc of the story of, of my presentation that I, I did provide some opportunities for solutions, but I, I do think I am really excited about natural climate solutions and taking action on restoration projects, um, native plant gardens. I think that these are all actions that people can take locally to both provide habitat for birds. Again, it's that sort of that adaptation piece, providing habitat native plants for birds is gonna give birds that resilience that they need for the amount of climate change that we're gonna see. And then it is actively also pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so I think that like, again, that's a win-win and I think everybody can sort of take action on that locally. I think the other most important thing to do is to be a voice for the birds when it comes to climate change, really talking to your elected officials, showing them that you care about this, um, showing up for clean energy projects. Like a lot of times there, there could be, you might not think that a clean energy project, you want it in your backyard, but if you can actually engage the folks that are on those projects and, and talk to them about how to do it in a way that is benef not beneficial for birds, but is gonna be least harmful for birds, we really need to have both the, the climate solutions as well as the clean energy work. So I think being a voice for local um, politicians or up to the federal level, I think that that's gonna be really important. And then showing up for these these things that are really important, natural climate solutions and clean energy. So um, as for climate week, I think there's a lot of options. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but maybe we can um, take a look at that and I can provide some some opportunities. I do know that Elizabeth Gray and Sarah Rose, who are uh, Elizabeth Gray is the CEO of Audubon and Sarah Rose is our VP of climate. Um, they are both going to be speaking uh, and at the climate week um, in particular about some of the stuff I already talked about, our natural climate solutions work, our transmission report. We're also working on an offshore wind report. Um, and so I think those would be some really exciting talks to see. And New York, it's New York City Bird Alliance is also, I know, having a couple of events that week as well. Um, I'm going to flip it over just because this is sort of in line with things people can do and actions they can take. But Someone asked, perhaps for simplistic, but are there purchase choices? Um, I always like these consumer questions because that's like really individual to people and what they can do. Um, are there purchase choices we can make to support nature-based climate solutions and biodiversity? That is a great question. Um, I I am not an expert in purchase choices, so I, I'm going to kind of defer on this for, for a little bit, but I, I will say that the urging your local state and federal elected officials to take action is really where we need to move the needle. Like taking individual actions is really important. Turning down your thermostat, buying light bulbs that are use less energy, 
hybrid cars. These are all important everyday actions using less plastic. Um, they're all important, but collectively, we really need to be making the big actions at the, the federal and state level and the country level, these like commitments to make the real changes that we need. So yes, individual actions matter, but getting the needle to move in the policy sphere is really going to be where we need to focus our, our attention. I would say also you can come to the Greenwich Audubon Center gift shop and buy bird friendly maple, but that's just a plug for yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Bird friendly maple is a great one, as is the uh, conservation ranching beef. Um, so definitely, I would definitely agree with that, that plug. Yeah, no, it's it's a very small thing, probably in the greater scheme of things. But um, so I I love this one too because you know I think that even when I was at Linnean the the urge to collaborate with other organizations is strong, but at the same time, you're working hard to sort of build your core within. So someone asked, um, as, as the Linnaean Society with our members of committed naturalists, can we collaborate with Audubon or other organizations to amplify and have a bigger impact in climate solutions? Definitely. I, I think that's a fantastic um, thing to, to bring up. I, I, so First I'll say is that Audubon is kind of local everywhere because we have chapters and centers and, and sanctuaries across the, the state, especially in New York. We have such a strong program in New York. Audubon New York uh, Connecticut program is really strong. And I think that there's opportunities locally to connect um, with those chapters, but also, yes, I think partnerships are the way we're gonna do it. These coalitions, some of the one, the coalitions I've talked about, about how we got those wins in certain states, including in like deep red states, um, I, it all was about partnerships and coalitions. And so, yes, I definitely think there are opportunities to sort of amplify this message. And the more people that are out there communicating it in the different ways that I spoke about is, is going to be what we need. Because a, a lot of times people don't even talk about climate change. You, you might have conversations with folks and it never even comes up, but it's such an important issue for our time and for everybody. We need to start those conversations. So, yes, I'm all for that. Um, okay, another question, kind of flipping back to policy, but does Audubon have a position on carbon offsets and whether this is a viable way to fund forest restoration and preservation? What safeguards do you believe need to be in place to ensure the, the offsets are actually having a positive impact? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something we do care a lot about at Audubon. We are not currently involved in carbon offsets, um, but we we do believe that like like for example our, our rancher our conservation ranching program we do want to make sure that the they have the opportunity to connect the work that they're doing which actually is the, the conservation ranching program is it started to benefit birds it's a bird friendly practice the management that they do and the way that they manage their cattle um, is meant to to be a bird first program but we also want to connect them with the carbon markets to see if they can get um, money for the offsets that they're providing for companies so we really want to ensure that the the offsets that we are connected with, even though we're not doing it ourselves, um, that they're in a way that is a conservation bird focused biodiversity first. Um, so I, I think that there there are ways that you can kind of get lost in, in, in these offsets where they're sort of just putting the problem elsewhere. We want to make sure that the way that we're going about it is that it, again, bird first, but also the climate benefit. So um, we're still working on kind of our position around that right now, and I think that we'll be talking a little bit more about that um, in the future, but I know that that that's sort of our our, our model, the sort of biodiversity bird first um, in terms of the, the offsets and any of the work that we're doing around this. Um, and then I'm going to ask another question that I think um, as a former New York City resident, and I think that people and it's sort of like, what can any one person do that has the most impact? And I think what you sort of alluded to is probably getting involved um, on, you know, in a policy level and influencing that. But um, this is a specific geographic question. And um, what are the best examples to highlight the potential of urban habitats to contribute to positive to to contribute positively to conservation, which is also an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, I mean, urban habitats have a lot of opportunity, actually. And in, in the report, we found that with the Natural Climate Solutions report, we found that urban and suburban communities actually had a huge potential for natural climate solutions. Um, there's actually big urban forestry programs that, um, that we can look into that I know New York has um, some opportunities with. Um, as well as uh, there's things, I mean, even like the High Line, I know it's not like a, a huge forest, but it is a, a, a sort of a, an example of native habitat within an urban setting. 
Um, so even within urban settings, there are opportunities to do natural climate solutions and restore habitats. So um, yeah, even a city like New York has, has opportunities. So I, I think that um, getting involved with uh, any of the local organizations that are doing on the ground restoration, including your, your center, as you mentioned, Rochelle, um, it's not like cities don't have opportunities. They, they definitely do. And in particular, like one of the things that we can think about with natural climate solutions, yes, they benefit birds, they benefit um, climate and carbon, but they also benefit people. So um, urban areas tend to be have an urban heat island effect when there's not a lot of vegetation, like the, the temperature gets trapped in the city because of all of the um, paved surfaces. But if you start planting trees, they, they actually have a cooling effect um, and so they can actually reduce the temperature. And so that's like a natural climate solution that provides a carbon benefit, a bird benefit. It's also like a human well-being benefit. Um, so again, I think urban forestry and there's a whole urban forestry program connected to the Fish and Wildlife Service um, that I think is is one opportunity that is pretty exciting. Yeah. Oh, and someone did ask, um, what's the center? Someone said, I missed the beginning. What's the center you spoke about? I was just speaking about, I mean, I'm at the Greenwich Center. There's a great center, um, the Teddy Roosevelt Center in Long Island in Oyster Bay, which is like fairly accessible by um, public transportation. Um, there's definitely chapters. There's a lot of direct sort of, you know, hands-on kind of feeling work and, and sort of collective policy engagement that people can do at centers, which I think can be a gateway to getting to know some of Audubon's work better. Um, so I encourage everyone to look on the Audubon website for um, center work or just, you know, like local ways to get involved. Um, and I think this is the last question for now, but please, if anyone has any more, um, type them in in this one because it's it's sort of positive. Um, so this person wrote in, grateful for ending this on a hopeful note. What are your top three policy proposals in New York right now? Um, I am not plugged into the New York policy, like specific New York City policy. I know that there, there's a wonderful legislation on bird friendly glass that happened in New York City recently. I, I don't know, Rochelle, you might be able to answer this better than me, or I can also circle back. Um, but I, I only yeah, no, I only know. Yeah, I think um, the rodenticide bill uh, was one that was like a it was not climate related, but it was a big sort of, you know, a high impact bird bill that was emerging in New York. I don't know where it is right now. Um, and definitely, you know, bird safe glass. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's, you know, generally like anything that was supporting green infrastructure. And I think there was some green roof legislature that was yeah. slated. Someone can write in now. Um, but we're probably, still, I, yeah, we're still trying to get the lights out bill passed. Um, that will be coming up in the city council very soon. So that that's something that everyone should contact their city council members about. Yeah, Debbie, Debbie is actually, probably, she should probably take over at this point. She's like really on the, has her finger yeah. on the pulse. The local yeah, comes I, I apologize for not knowing the local uh, <laughs> yeah. policy very well, but I will say that Audubon, the, the Audubon New York um, has a wonderful policy team and they have stuff up on the Audubon New York website. Um, and constantly, if you're an Audubon member or a New York member, you will get emails about policy actions to sign up for. Um, and then New York City, it sounds like um, Debbie knows a lot and can share that with you as well as I, I would also check out um, New York Bird Alliance uh, to see what they're doing specifically around birds as well. Yeah, I think all of the, you know, the chapters and the state programs in New York State and Connecticut, they all have different policy action alerts that you can sign up for. And so then you'll get uh, more of that local news effect depending on where you reside. So that's probably a good place for people to start. Um, Okay, I think that that's probably the the last question. I was kind of interested just because so many people ask about the impact of invasive species. So it's my personal question and how invasive species will maybe be a variable. This is a question that people get when, you know, sort of birding question, but people, you know, I think there's a lot of focus when you're birding. You think so much about uh, sort of this displacement of birds through the increase in starlings or house bears. And so is there, is like, is there a climate sort of a climate impact that's, you know, are invasive species going to proliferate even more and sort of displace birds? Or is that such a multi-level variable analysis? It's a tough one. Yeah, yeah I think it's a multi-level question. Um, 
not all of the species that are invasive are actually going to do well with climate change. And some of the invasive species are actually not doing well in general. When you look at the 3 billion birds report, actually a lot of the declines do come from invasive species. So it will be interesting to see sort of how they do into the future. Um, and it, it is a big part of this. Like we we do need to be concerned about invasive species, but, I, but yeah, it's a, it's a multi-level factor. I mean, invasive plant species are also an issue and we need to sort of weigh the, the invasive species and habitat loss versus the carbon component um, of, of vegetation. But I do think restoring native habitats is going to be the most beneficial because then that's going to provide the, the habitat and support for the native bird species and other wildlife. So um, it is a big part of it, but not all of our the invasive species are going to thrive under climate change. So we'll have to take a look at each individual one. I think that's a great answer. And I think that's, oh, wait, I think we might have one more. A great presentation. Yes, I agree. Yeah. It was. I think this is a really great talk. There's so many things, nuggets I'm going to take from this probably to relate to others. So I, I really appreciate it personally. Um, thanks, Debbie, for hosting me. And I, I think, do I pass it back to you to adjourn the meeting or do I adjourn the meeting? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to ask. Uh, it's an old, old tradition here at the Linnaean Society, and I we didn't work it out. Yeah, you can go ahead and, and adjourn the meeting. But Brooke, thank you so much for that great talk. That was really very um, inspirational. I hope we'll all get to work on doing everything that we can, um, including watching the debate tonight and keeping our ears open for those climate solutions. So thank you for being here, and thank you, Rochelle, for moderating the Q&A. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. and. Let me know if, if anybody has any questions. Okay. Good night, right. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.